So now we want to talk about adiabatic flame temperature. Maybe you've heard about this. Maybe you already know from your experience working with welding or with uh, metals and, or working with soldering that certain fuels, hydrocarbon fuels, burn at a different temperature. And even if you burn it with pure oxygen, it burns at a lot of higher temperature. Okay, so how do we calculate this adiabatic flame temperature? First of all, what's the word adiabatic mean? No heat transfer. So that's an assumption that all the chemical reaction heat release goes into heating up the products. So it brings out the products, the flame, at the highest possible temperature. How would you calculate that highest possible temperature, that adiabatic flame temperature? Well, you do it with the... What's that equation? First law, energy balance for a control volume. Do you have any work? This term is almost always. I don't remember one problem in this chapter where that term is not zero. All right. If it's adiabatic, what is this term? Zero. And so all of the reactants, they're brought in at standard conditions. And the products are brought out at the high temperature. So this is the TH at the adiabatic flame temperature minus the molar enthalpy at the reference 298. So the changes in the enthalpy of formation because it's going from a hydrocarbon to carbon dioxide and hydrocarbon going to water vapor, that really gives you that heat release which then creates very hot products. Maybe a better way of looking at it is to look at this form of the same equation. Isn't that the same form? Or the same equation, different form. What is this term? Yeah, so it's that uh, uh, enthalpy change of formations due to the combustion process. It's related to the heating value. Remember, you could, you could move on the kilojoules of heat release per kilomole of the fuel. You could move over to a heating value by um, um, dividing by the molar mass. Uh, and then the molar mass has units kilojoules or kilograms per kilomole. And then you get kilojoules of heat release per kilogram of fuel, the heating value. So this equation makes it a little more easy to see. You don't have any hot or incoming gases which are hot or incoming fuel or reactants that are hot. They all come in at standard conditions, 25C, no work. And then what you want is you want this term to be equal to zero such that what causes it to be zero? This molar enthalpy at the adiabatic flame temperature minus the molar enthalpy at the reference 298 Kelvin. So this is typically a large negative number. And this term right here in the products that dictated by the temperature products increasingly is a large positive number as the adiabatic flame temperature gets higher and higher until they cancel. They sum to zero. Then that's your adiabatic flame temperature. All right. So you may be given a problem like this. Say, hey, here's propane. It's standard flame temperature. The propane, the fuel, is brought in at 25C. The air or the oxygen used for combustion is brought in at 25C. But what happens is, is uh, they burn and they go out at a lot higher temperature, the adiabatic flame temperature. So in that furnace, operating steady states, burns completely 100% theoretical air, and the air is 25C. How would you compute? that adiabatic flame temperature. Well, our equation would be our Q dot divided by N dot of the fuel. We desire that to be uh, zero. And then the sum over the products, the stoichiometric coefficient, and then the enthalpy at the adiabatic flame minus the enthalpy at 298 for each of those products. Okay. So what you do is you say, how do I do this? Well, if I knew what the adiabatic flame temperature is, I could go to the gas tables, the ideal gas tables, look up those molar enthalpies, 
take the difference with the molar enthalpy at 298, have the stoichiometric coefficient in my balanced reaction equation, and I would calculate this only once based on the enthalpies of formation, and then I would work such that this whole right-hand side equals to zero, then it's adiabatic. So this sets up the a strategy for solving it by hand on exams or in homework or in this class without the extensive use of a computer of uh, guessing or picking an adiabatic flame temperature, computing that right hand side, seeing if it's zero or not, if it's not going to be zero on your first pick, but then judiciously iterating until you drive it to zero. That's how you do it by hand. All right? So this war brings up some warm, fuzzy feelings from your class in numerical methods. Remember, you have a function f, and you say, oh, I'm really looking for that x such that f is equal to zero. So you go ahead and you plot that function, and it does something like this. And you say, aha, that's the, the actual root that I want to calculate. I want to know that x such that f goes is equal to zero at that x. That's all we're doing. And so the strategy, especially for this class, is to guess the temperature high and low. Now, the air tables max out at about 3,000 Kelvin. I can't remember the max temperature on it. But uh, the low temperature, I know it's probably around 298 or a little lower. So if I have something like propane, you just say, well, it's going to be around so much Kelvin. It's not going to be dramatically, it's not going to be over 3,000. So you just, so you pick something like, okay, here is zero, here is 1,000, here is 2,000. I'm just kind of sketching. Here's 3,000. So the guess, the recipe for success in this class is just pick 3,000 temperature and compute it. The Q is not going to be zero. You probably are going to get a um, positive Q, meaning you're going to have to add heat to get the products to really come out at 3,000. It's, it's not 80 about it. Pick something that's like 1,000. Ah, it's cold coming out. There's going to be a, a negative uh, Q dot over N dot, meaning it's exothermic if the products really come out at 1,000. Then from your numerical methods class, you just do a straight line in between. See where it crosses? That's your next best guess. It's not newton rapson It's one of the variations of newton rapson It's not secant. It's like secant. I learned it like bisection. You have to have initial guess above and initial guess below. Then you bracket it, and it's in between. And it converges pretty quickly. And especially for these problems, that's my recommendation, 1,000 and 3,000, and move on. All right? You'll converge pretty quickly. Professor, I didn't really understand uh, what you're doing there. Well, let's put some numbers together. Let's say that I put in 1,000 for the temperature. And when I computed Q dot divided by N dot, I came in with this number, which is pretty realistic to some numbers we're going to run. I know that number looks big, but it's like 1.2 million. So let's do this. Here's negative 1 million. Here's negative, negative 1.2 million kilojoules per kilomole. Then I picked 3,000. Okay, here's 2,000, there's 3,000. And I computed it. Oh, it came in positive. It went to the other side. Hey, that's great. I bracketed it. Somewhere in between is the root. And so the Q dot divided by N dot, when the temperature is 3,000, comes in at positive 600,000 or 0.6 million, keeping it on the same scale. Oh, it comes in right about here, 0.6, right there. See, 0 0.6, 3,000. Here, negative 1.2 at 1,000. The 1,000 is getting in my way, so I put it over there. All right, draw a straight line. What's my next best guess? I want you to do interpolation, professor. This is a 4,000 level class. Don't insult me. 
no, I'm insulting you. Do it, and uh, then open it up in clicker and input your best guess at the adiabatic flame temperature. So I'm gonna move this over to numeric input and turn it on. Hope you understand the problem. I explained it the best I can. Let's see what you come up with. So um, basically, I don't know how you learned it in um, high school or whatever. Maybe this is point one, this is point two, this is given x1, y1, this is given the point x2, y2, and you set it up such that I'm looking for uh, the fraction x, so x minus x1 divided by x2 minus x1 is the same fraction as the, in the x-axis is the y, is equal to y minus y1 divided by y2 minus y1. And what you want is you want this particular y to equal 0. And so uh, you're looking to find this x. This is what you need to find. And so in this application, x1 is 1,000. x2 is 3,000. All right, and then this y1 over here, I mean, I'd, if I had more digits, you'd have to put them all in, but you could just put in that it's uh, uh, negative 1.2. That'll work, or if you want to put in the million, go ahead. And then this is y2 is a plus 0 0.6, and this is a negative of a 1.2. So you have to worry a little bit about the negative, a negative 1.2, sorry. Right, uh, and when you did that, <clears throat> you get uh, this number. But did I put it to three significant digits or not? I can't remember. Yeah, I only put it to two there. So, but uh, let's see. This is uh, 2330, right? Yes. 2330. Good. Good. All right. Let's move on. So what you do is a lot of work, but you've done this before. You pick the adiabatic or the outlet flame temperature to be a thousand. You then go and compute <coughs> negative one point four three six four. Too many digits, but there it is. How do you do it? Well, you have to have your propane balance reaction equation. You have to get the carbon balance to give you that coefficient. The hydrogen balance to get that coefficient, the oxygen balance to get that coefficient, you multiply that times the 3.76 to get the nitrogen, and then the nitrogen's balance. Okay. Then you write it out for your all the components. A lot of things are coming in at 298, 298, 298, 298. All of the reactants come in, so you could even just cancel this. And then you have the enthalpy of formation of nitrogen, that's zero. Enthalpy of formation of oxygen, that's zero. You know, there's a lot of terms that either cancel or are zero. But I tried to put them all here. But there's really, if I go to the next table, remember, this is 1,000 Kelvin. I have to pick out 298 and 1,000 for the temperatures. I have to get the carbon dioxide, molar enthalpy, and well, at the, both those temperatures. So those two of the values I need out of the table. It's a little tedious, but... And then for the water vapor and the products, I need the molar enthalpy at 298, the molar enthalpy at 1,000. And then for the nitrogen, the molar enthalpy going out in the products, there you go. So I had to grab those six numbers out of the table to actually finish out these calcs. And then you have to get the enthalpy of formation for the, the, the I, I, I don't have, that's C3H8, right? That's the propane and then the uh, water. Hey, verify that it's 74850 for propane in your table. Can you do that? What's the enthalpy of formation? Hopefully I didn't look it up for methane and put it in there. Whoops, have an error if I did. I try to change each problem a little bit from semester to semester. That's usually how I introduce errors in my lecture, by trying to change it up. Great. 
I just did it for methane. But I have the right stoichiometric coefficient. So, all right, so this one right here, what is it for propane? One oh three eight five oh. All right. Well, hopefully it's close to this number. And then you would do the same thing for three thousand Kelvin. Get another number, do the interpolation, you get a next best estimate, and then guess what? Replace one of those two if it's negative or positive, you know, rerun it and then keep up. That's the root finding. So you don't, you can do one iteration, but if you continue after multiple iterations, it converges to a better number. I think this one is correct in the sense that I probably did it on a computer with, with propane. All right. But here it is. After a few iterations, 2,394 Kelvin, which gives you 2,120 degrees C, and you say, how does that compare with the literature? And you can go out a lot of places on the internet. This book, I don't recall having a good summary of uh, adiabatic flame temperatures for different fuels, but you could find propane, you have two cases. One, you're burning it with air or oxygen. Can you tell which one's higher? If you burn it with pure oxygen, it's higher flame temperature because the nitrogen doesn't have to be heated up in the products. But if you burn it with air, there's a lot of nitrogen going along, and so it reduces. The presence of nitrogen reduces the adiabatic flame temperature. It's in the vicinity of the ones we calculated. Well, why would there be any deviation? Well, the textbook summarizes and says, well, we don't have typically complete combustion in the real world. We don't do have at high temperatures disassociation of products. N2 doesn't like to always stay as N2, sometimes it comes out as oxides of nitrogen at elevated temperatures. How many people know on emissions of uh, automobiles what they introduced in late 70s, early 80s, it's standards, it's uh, EGR, exhaust gas recirculation or recycle they call it, EGR. Why? To temper the peak temperature to reduce the NOx, oxides of nitrogen. A lot of uh, um, challenges or systems have been introduced uh, to minimize the emission of uh, nitrous oxides. And that when are they generated? They're generated due to dissociation at high temperatures. All right, heat loss. Well, you have this flame, and when you see the real flame, you can see the blue flame or yellow parts of it. Uh, you can see it radiating energy. Well, that's not accounted for. We have done a complete uh, heat uh, adiabatic calculation. And then often there's a little excess air, even though they don't want to have a lot of excess air, that would reduce your flame temperature. But experimental measurements come in where we're close. So hopefully that gives you a warm, fuzzy feel. Another thing that, hey, I learned something in this class related to the world that I live in and see. And especially if you're a welder or you need to, to, to work with high temperatures. The last topic that I want to cover this semester is a CO2 emission. Professor, where do I find that part of in the textbook? It's not. Well, could this be on the final exam? Yes, it could. But really, I don't just teach because the stuff is on the final exam. Sometimes I, I try to cover stuff that I think is practical and important. When you see CO2 emission, what do you think of? Global climate change. Yeah, that type of thing. And uh, over last, well, in, since Industrial Revolution, we've been uh, burning a lot of fossil fuels, coal and different liquid hydrocarbons, natural gases, and a lot of CO2 emissions going into the atmosphere. And then slowly people realize, hey, uh, when you dump a lot of sulfur in the atmosphere, you get sulfuric acid type of rain and that's been cleaned up was cleaned up heavily in the 70s and 80s uh, when you dump a lot of refrigerants into the atmosphere sometimes they go up to the high levels and then they interact with high level ozone and then you oops eat holes in your ozone layer remember we covered that environmental impact well this is one of those that's going to 
when I was in your shoes, when I was taking class, nobody talked about CO2 emission. Everybody's talking about it. You can't watch the news without talking about CO2 emission. And different strategies that the politicians and different governments are having. What, you know, just look at all the, the, the climate accords and agreements. They're going to reduce this and reduce that, et cetera. What is that new one they, that one of the politicians put out? The Green Deal or something, the big Green Deal? Yeah, guess what it's all about? So let's, we have the tools. We can do things. We can analyze things. And so let's jump into it. For every kilogram of gasoline, which we approximate as octane, hey, what, what is my molecular formula for octane? C what? H what? C8 H18. If you had to just pick one for gasoline, just pick that one. It's not the perfect one, but at least it's one. Okay. So we're going to approximate gasoline as just octane. It's burned in an automobile or some engine. Estimate the amount of CO2 that's produced. How many kilograms of CO2 come out for every kilogram of octane combusted? I'm going to pause. I really want you to do this. Guessing it's calculating. Well, how many people knew that they needed to get the balanced reaction equation at least for this problem? Yeah, so what you're doing is you're saying, hey, this plus some oxygen, and if I get it from air, I'm going to have that 3.76 N2 going for the ride. I don't know this coefficient yet. I'll balance it out, but I'm going to produce equal to or going to so many CO2s and so many H2Os and then so many leftover or going for the ride, non nitrogens. Okay, so when you balance the carbon, what do you get for the CO2? Eight. Eight. At this point, you can finish it out. You find that you need nine for the, but you don't need to get that number. All you needed was eight. But I'm going to finish it out. And then this goes to uh, 25 divided by two. You've done it a few times, 25 divided by two. Okay. So the key is, from this equation, you say one kilomole of fuel, which is my octane, leads to the production of eight kilomoles of carbon dioxide. I get a one to eight ratio. The other thing is, I'm looking up here, and they're talking mass, kilograms. I need that special parameter that lets me go between mass and kilomoles. The name of that, the big M, was molar mass. And so I'm going to need to know the molar mass of my fuel, and I need to know the molar mass of carbon dioxide. Equipped with this, this, and this, you can answer that question. Hey, what is the molar mass of carbon dioxide? 44. Now, there's a way that you can get it out of the table. You get it 44.01, or just by using what you learned in your chemistry class, that about AMUs and counting atomic mass units. And so for every carbon, it has an AMU of 12. And for every oxygen, it has an AMU of 16. Where'd you do that? Well, you solve so many problems, you just remember these things, right? Yeah. And so it's a 12 plus two carb, two oxygens. And so you get the 44. 44 what? Kilograms per kilomole. You could do the same thing for this fuel little more math. Let's take a look at the fuel. It's C8. Hey, so I have eight carbons. Each carbon was 12. Boy, I have to do some math here. 96. And then I had 18 hydrogens. AMU is one. Now I have to add 18 and 96. What do you get? One. One, four, 114 kilograms per kilomole. It's really close, right? So these are the three numbers, 114 kilograms per kilomole for my fuel and 44 kilograms per kilomole of carbon dioxide. Equipped with those three things, I'm going to give you a little extra time either to change your answer or to input an answer. Hmm. So if you 
This is the truthful statement right here. The one kilomole of the fuel generates eight kilomoles of carbon dioxide. Well, I have to convert one kilomole of fuel. I convert it into how many kilograms? 114 kilograms of the fuel is equivalent to one kilomole of the fuel. Is that true or false? Yeah. And so, so I have 114 kilograms of fuel produce eight kilomoles of the carbon dioxide. Now I need to figure out how many, how, how much mass is eight kilomoles of carbon dioxide. So that's eight times 44. Three what? 352. So 114 kilograms of the fuel produce 352 kilograms of the carbon dioxide. Now I had I had it per every one, so I just divide over by 114. So one kilogram of the fuel produces around three kilograms. Okay, did that make sense? Now something you say something's wrong. Hold it. It's like going to a bank. I bring in a dollar, and then later I go to the teller on the outside window, and I check out, and I get three dollars. This is great. I love that bank, right? Go to one teller, input a dollar, go to another teller, get three dollars out, withdraw. But that's really not what you're doing, because yes, the fuel is only coming in one kilogram, and what's happening is you're bringing in plenty of kilograms of air, and when you go out with uh, nearly three kilograms or around three kilograms of carbon dioxide, you're also going out with so many kilograms of water vapor. We didn't even make that calculation. But look at the mass of the carbon dioxide. It's made up two O's and only one C. The two O's, 16 plus 16, it's 32. The oxygens are 32 AMUs, 32 in, compared to 12. The carbon dioxide is mostly oxygen, right? Plants love it. Plants do, what do they call that, photosynthesis with it? Take the carbon and grow, release the oxygen back into the atmosphere. Anyway, but uh, let's press on now. That Remember that number, though. What is your CO2 emission per year due to consumption of coal-generated electricity or gasoline as you drive an automobile? So this is what we're going to attack. This is what we're going to talk about. You can go to the website. You'll see a lot of these out there. They look at, hey, this is how many million metric tons of CO2 are pumped out, and this is only 2015, and it's due to people driving. People using electricity, people in industrial production, facilities, commercial buildings, blah, blah, blah. Let's continue on. So if we focus on the automobile, and we already started with that kilogram of gasoline, right? The next question is, is for every gallon of gas, because I don't buy it in kilos, I buy it in gallons. Well, some people say, hey, I'm in another country. I buy in liters. Here's the conversion, 3.78 liters is a gallon, close enough. And we burn that in an automobile. How many, what amount of CO2 is produced for every gallon? You're going to use that coefficient you just calculated. And you're also going to use the specific gallon of gasoline is 0.739. So for every gallon of gas, how many kilograms of CO2 go out the tailpipe? Make that calculation and input it right now. All right, so let me jump in here and talk a little bit. So somebody says, this is the volume, but basically if I wanted to know the mass of water that was um, in a certain volume, I would multiply the density of the water times the volume of the water, the container, right? And so uh, in this case, I don't want to know the mass of the water. I want to know the mass of the gas in the volume of one gallon or 3.78 liters of gas. And so one way of calculating is, say, instead of knowing the density of the gas, often they report it relative to a very common fluid, 
that's all around us called water. And so the density of the gas is the specific gravity of the gas times the density of the water. Oh, I wish I could recall the density of water. Come on now. There's a few things you should know and just be able to recall. What is the density of water? If I have one liter water bottle, there's probably a liter water bottle around here, right? You hold it up, you shake it, you feel it. Did I encourage you to do that already this semester? Yeah. How many kilos in one liter? One. One kilogram. So this, this is one kilogram of water per one liter. We have 3.78 liters, and we have a specific gravity, 739. Hey, what are the units on that? Well, it's kilograms of whatever fluid per kilogram of water. It's, it's dimensionless. But you end up with uh, how many kilograms of gas. So how many kilograms of gas do we get when we buy a, a, a gallon of gas? Whatever, and then what you do is you, you multiply by, was it 3.088? Was that our number before? For every kilogram of fuel from the previous exercise, how many kilograms of CO2 do we get? Wasn't it 3.0 something? 3.09? All right, so we'll stop this, and we'll uh, go look at our results. And uh, we get about 9 I think I have it on the next slide. So 8.625 kilograms. All right. So um, we already did that, the one where I broke it out and did the one kilogram of fuel gives you about 3.0 something kilograms of carbon dioxide. All right. All right. You can take and go to EPA website. Uh, Environmental Protection Agency, you can take a look at, hey, they've done some work and they say for every gallon of gasoline consumed, the CO2 emission is around 9.9 kilograms. What did we just calculate? Pretty good. Or this is 8.9, sorry, 8.9 kilograms. All right, let's continue on. This is, I'm going to move through these next three questions a little quicker. Uh, just answer the best you can. Maybe you drive an automobile. Maybe you own an automobile. Maybe you've ridden in an automobile. Can you estimate the number of miles that the average automobile in the United States drives per year, average? Does the automobile go 2,000 miles on average? 20,000? 200,000? 2 million or 20 million miles in a year? <laughs> it will close it out. And I point out that I saw this article yesterday. Another Toyota trough, tough truck hits 1 million miles. Very rare does any vehicle hit 1 million miles. So those that were kind of like here and here, you're, you're kind of super unrealistic, but that's okay, right? So let's just show the results here. It's about 20,000 miles. I drive a little less than 20,000 miles a year. I, I average probably around 15,000. All right, the next question, though, we're going to assume that you drive 20,000 miles per year. Uh, what's your average fuel economy? Uh, how many... How many miles per gallon the average vehicle people drive that you see around on the roads, what are they getting? <laughs> now, I said, well, since that truck uh, did so well, it got over a million. I said, well, 2007 Toyota Tundra, that was the vehicle that they talked about. It gets 17 MPG City and 20 Highway. There's a lot of vehicles that are around 20 highway out on the road today. Now, I have personally driven a vehicle that I haul a trailer with, and it gets below 10. I wish it did get 10. I wish it did get 10, but it's below 10. And the vehicle that I drive is a little Camry, and it's close to 30. So those are all good contenders. But the average, I would say, is around 20. 
Okay, we're going to count these all, right? So everybody's happy. All right. Now the last one. What? How many gallons of gas does that typical average driver driving 20,000 miles getting 20 miles per gallon? How many gallons of gas do they have to purchase per year? Let's take a look. And, yeah, we have to buy about a thousand uh, gallons. Well, well, yeah, somebody's not thinking on D. Well, they're probably not in this room. I figured out some people have participated. They're not in this room. Uh, because think about it. If you paid, let's say, $3 a gallon, you're paying around $3,000 for your fuel bill per year, right? Uh, this person, oh yeah, my fuel, I use 100,000 gallons. You got $300,000 worth of fuel bill? Man, your personal automobile? Wow, that's something else. Anyway, okay, so there you go, 1,000 gallons. So we already talked about that, we already talked about that. So now, how many kilograms of CO2? If you purchase 1,000 gallons and you drive your 20,000 miles and 20 MPG, your vehicle, what are you responsible for putting out the tailpipe? There you go. How many kilograms of CO2? That's a lot of kilograms of CO2 you're putting out the tailpipe. And then you're not even a long haul trucker, you know? Um, this is just getting around town to school, work, wherever you want to get to. So uh, isn't it 9,000? It's a lot, a lot. Okay, so you can go to the EPA. We just did some simple calculations, but they have, they get bombarded with questions like that, like what's the average annual carbon dioxide emissions for a typical passenger vehicle? We just did that. And what did we calculate? Well, we're doing it kind of for the Texas standard, not for the U.S. average, because they said, oh, we get about 21.6 miles per gallon for the average vehicle, but they only drive 11.4 thousand miles per year. And remember they had this number for how many nine point uh, or eight point nine kilograms of co2 emission per gallon of gas so these are the type of calculations that the politicians are talking about um, i love the politicians we're going to go to net zero blah 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 yeah well okay stop flying your airplane and and let's go there okay now we move from our gasoline because we did a pretty good job of our co2 emission from driving around what about electricity? How many people have paid an electric bill? Okay, per person in a house or apartment. Now, if you have three people, you got to divide it by three because everything's going to be per person now. If you have four people in a house, you got to divide it by four. What is your monthly electric bill per person? And this is going to be uh, a numeric input. I need to know dollars. All right, let's see how much you people are spending. 50, you know, that's a pretty good number. Uh, 30, 100. All right, somebody is paying a lot of money. Okay, 150, really? Per person, yeah, this person. 110. Uh, the other... No. Let's let go. Good job. So I estimate $90. No, what did I estimate? I forgot what I estimated. Yeah, $90 monthly bill average per person. Okay? So if it's a $90 per person and it costs 10 cents per kilowatt hour, how much per the year, the whole year, how much energy did you buy in the form of electric energy? measured in kilowatt hours that's how you measure electric consumption in kilowatt hours i'm going to get this back to multiple choice and go for it 90 dollars per month how many months in a year professor i'm going to stop yeah we show the results and yeah it's around there okay let's jump back here and discover this 
So you use, uh, you spend about, uh, you know, ten, one thousand eighty dollars, and if it's ten cents a kilowatt hour, you find out that you got around 11,000 kilowatt hours of electric energy that you had to purchase. Now, somebody says, I live in Houston, you're paying around 12. If you live in the valley, you're paying around 12. If you live in El Laredo, 12. El Paso, a little higher. Some parts of Texas, San Antonio is some of the cheapest. It's around 10 cents. It's been around 10 cents for a long time. I live in Hawaii, congratulations. You're paying a lot more. <laughs> 30 cents a kilowatt hour or something like that, okay? Some other remote locations where they don't have dams to make it. If you live in Tennessee, you have the, they've dammed up the TVA. If you live in the state of Washington, they get a lot of hydro there too. It's cheaper. Las Vegas, uh, because of the Hoover Dam, cheaper. But then other places, sorry, you know, you just got to pay. All right. Here it is. They're showing you uh, just... You know, I kind of calibrated my numbers to some of their numbers. So that's how many kilowatt hours. The average uh, per person in the person. Now, they say, hey, if you live in, get this state, Louisiana has some of the highest annual electric consumption. Why, Louisiana? It's called summer and humidity. And it's expensive to air condition, but people are living in air conditioned places in Louisiana. Now, also, they say Hawaii has some of the lowest use consumption. Why? It's pretty temperate. You know, it doesn't have that huge change in hot summer and cold winter. Plus, also, if the price is three times more than the national average, think about this. Let's say we're spending $3 per gallon of gas. Okay. Okay, let's say that the price was, you moved, you were driving through a state or you'd moved to a state where it was three times more. It's $9 per gallon of gas. Is it going to impact your driving? Oh, yeah. You bet. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm going to be looking for that fuel-efficient vehicle. And I'm not going to be driving just everywhere and anywhere. Well, anyway, in Hawaii, they'll turn it off when not needed. Okay. The average annual coal consumption, remember, we're going to make all of our electricity that you use in your house by coal. That's going to be the benchmark. Now, you say in San Antonio, we get about 30% from nuclear. No CO2 emission from nuclear. And you're going to see that more and more in the news because now some of the people, green, don't want to close some of those nuclear power plants. That's what they're talking about. It's in the news. Why? They don't like the nuclear waste. They don't like the nuclear risk. They hate that, but they sure do like the lack of CO2 emission into the atmosphere from a nuclear power, power plant. This is things that you're going to struggle with. That's why on the last day of this class, I want to talk about it. You're equipped, you're equipped to do some calculations, analysis. Okay, so how much coal is used? You're going to need to know this. What is coal? Just carbon. In our table, carbon with the S, what's that mean? Solid, like I put a chunk of coal right here. Boom. Now. Real coal varies from widely, so it's not all carbon, but we'll approximate it just to be carbon. And also, you need to know essentially the thermal efficiency of a power plant. So if I put in one kilojoule of heat energy, how many kilojoules of shaft work make the electricity? 35% of it. I get 0.35 kilojoules of electricity. That's just kind of the electric plant thermal efficiency, 35%. You, are, you can now estimate how many metric tons you need for what we just calculated, how many kilo, kilowatt hours of electricity you consume. Do you want me to just show you the calc, or do you want to struggle with it for a minute? Fine. Look at that. 3,000 metric tons. If somebody says, I got a pile of coal over here, a shovel in a wheelbarrow, and I want you to move it over there. You're going to do that in a few minutes, a few hours, or even you're just going to throw the shovel down. I want another job. I quit. That's a lot. That's your annual consumption based on nine. Hey, some people said they get a bigger electric bill. You're putting out, thank you much, more CO2. You're responsible, personally responsible for more CO2 emissions because of your consumption. Now, you're saying in San Antonio, again, 
the percent coal has gone way down in the CPS portfolio. Wind is way up. Natural gas is way up. Nuclear has been very constant. It's been a backbone of a lot of electricity used in the city here. It's great for consumers, great for everybody. Low CO2 emissions, but there's some other utilities. That's all they rely on is coal. So you have to get this number out of the coal. You also had to get this uh, heating value, the lower heating value. I forgot to bring that out and tell you that you needed that one too. Because you need to know, okay, I take a kilogram of coal, how much heat do I get out of it when I burn it? You get that from the lower heating value. All right. Average annual CO2 emissions due to your electric consumption. So I think we pretty well did this, didn't we? Uh, 12 metric tons. Oh, once I, once I use the, uh, the uh, heat release, um, then I can uh, convert it over. And uh, you're putting out a lot of tons of CO2 emission. Each person. Sent, that's, the, that's a lot of emission. So if you do these calculations and follow the discussion we just did, it looks like every year you're doing about 9 million I mean, sorry, metric tons due to gasoline in transportation. And you're doing, you know, here around 12 metric tons due to your electricity. How does it match? Not bad with these other, you know, um, percentages that the EPA puts out. I wanted to talk about this topic. Natural gas. What happened the last 10 or 15 years? The price of natural gas plummeted. Why fracking? All right. Right now, we have a lot of UTSA grads, mechanical engineering, doing very well uh, in the Eagle Ford shale, as well as the uh, Permian Basin. Uh, the, the, uh, I forget what they call that shale deposit over there, but it's t at least 10 times bigger than the Eagle Ford shale. And there's a lot of people out working in it. It's been a big boom uh, for the whole United States economy. The price of natural gas has plummeted. Well, when the price of fuel plummets, the heat release is pretty significant. You burn natural gas. Well, they're trying to do transportation. And so maybe you've seen a lot of buses, you know, hey, we got the clean burning bus via clean burning buses. We've got compressed natural gas on board. There's a lot of gas stations that have compressed natural gas to refueling. And then also liquefied natural gas. Now that's cold, very cold, uh, but it's coming on board. All right, so maybe you've seen a station like this or buses like that. And why? Because the price, would, the heat release is great for the cost, the actual dollars for that fuel. It's very um, affordable. So you could even just go online. I encourage you to do something like this. Let me look at what a LNG refueling station looks like. They don't have them for automobiles. They just have them for long haul truckers. Flying J truck stops. You ever seen one? They have them. They have them, I think, at every Flying J in the nation, or at least about 75% of them do now. LNG, refueling capability. It's, it's been just in the last few years a real push. And so they'll, they'll look like this, or they'll look like this. And so I don't know, you know how close you can get to one of these to go and inspect them. They're like, hey, I'm on a field trip. I'm a student studying engineering. You know, get out of here, kid. We're refueling our trucks, you know? <laughs> But uh, but maybe you maybe has anybody seen one up close personal? Anybody refueled one a vehicle with either compressed natural gas or the LNG? Seen any YouTube videos? They're out there. You can see how the guy. Oh, I'm going to show you how I'm doing this now, and it's pretty slick. It's pretty. I mean, it's pretty safe too. Um, you know, some states. I think it's New Jersey. Uh, it's against the law for a person to actually put gasoline in their own get cars fuel tank. Is so dangerous of an operation. You must have a specialized operator's license to operate the. Anyway, but uh, <laughs> but the trucker can do the fueling on the LNG. So look around uh, again. There's more compressed natural gas refueling stations uh, than the liquefied natural gas refueling stations. But I think. When I talk and look and everything else, my, my money would be on the future of LNG and CNG. And maybe someday you'll even see it in automobiles. Uh, just think of it. If you said $3 a gallon gasoline, right, and it went a factor of three up to $9, wouldn't it change your behavior? 
But let's say that some gas station did a fuel and they were selling it one dollar a gallon. Think about what the line would look like on Bandera Road if there was a gas station selling gallons, you know, as much as you wanted to buy, fill up your car, one dollar a gallon gas. You'd be pushing your grandmother over in her wheelchair to get in that line. You, you know what I mean? You'd be the, the most terrible road rage to get in that line. But anyway, uh, that's what drives these decisions, the economy, economics of it all. All right, so this is the last type of question you could do. So we're currently burning gasoline, approximated as octane. Somebody says, I want to convert and run on methane. Same engine. You know those truckers? They have a little diesel tank, and then they have the big tank for the LNG or CNG. It still is running with a little kick and start on the combustion with the diesel. So what is the percent reduction of the CO2 in the emission? We have all the tools to, to make that calculation. I can see you're tired, so maybe I'll summarize the calculation. But let's guess. Let's just guess. Somebody says, I'm going to move to this cleaner fuel. Remember the bus size and the, hey, I'm burning natural gas, clean burning natural gas. You're happy you can breathe easier because I'm driving down your street using this bus using not diesel but using using natural gas so what percent reduction in the co2 emission would you expect to achieve 25 percent reduction 90 percent reduction 95 percent reduction what percent reduction and so if it's you know what i mean by percent reduction if it's 25 percent reduction that means 75 percent is still put out yeah if it's 95% reduction, only 5% is still put out. This is a guess, isn't it? You going to guess? You already did. All right, we're going to see how everybody's guess is then. We're going to stop it. Professor, I'd have a better guess if you uncover those black boxes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Which means you're all guessing. It's, it's not as much as you might think. You, you know, if all the PR, all the PR is like, wow, this is like almost no emission. But guess what? There's still a lot of CO2 emission. Now, one of the things that's true about it that I'm, I should say, how much sulfur is there in diesel? A lot. That's why they, had, they went to low sulfur diesel and the price jumped and it's been high. Or how much mercury, HG, is in coal, you know, or other things. There's trace elements which are bad. But uh, um, so the clean burning is that not just the CO2, but there's less other emissions. But if you do the calculations, it's around a 24% reduction. Yes, you still have CO2 emission, a significant amount of CO2 emission. But uh, you do get some reduction in the CO2 emission. Well, with that, I'd like to emphasize that I'm cheating you out of a full education. Yes. Um, third law of thermodynamics and absolute entropy. I don't know how, but we just went too slow this semester. Did, you, did it feel like this semester went too slow? I don't know where the time goes. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be here for any questions. Thank you.